Well, let's uh, turn to God's Word and to 1 Peter uh, chapter 4 as we come uh, this evening to consider living in a polluted world. Living in a polluted world. There are all sorts of pollution that goes on around us, whether it's the smog that envelops many of our major cities, whether it's the debris uh, on the, the seashore, pieces of plastic washed up, or whether it's the, um, the, the images you see of uh, bits of plastic or fishing line or hooks embedded or wrapping around the necks of animals uh, in the ocean, or whether it's out for a walk in your own locality and you find a fridge dumped in a shuck at the side of the road, or several tyres hurled over a hedge, uh, or a bin liner of rubbish that somebody has taken and tied the neck of and they've taken it away up into the the fields and into the hills and they've just turfed it uh, over uh, the side of a hedge. Um, And you think, why? Why Why go to all that trouble uh, to do that when you could have just put it in a bin? And okay, it's going to cost a little bit, but why ruin uh, the countryside? And yet that's not the only sort of pollution uh, that there is in our world. That's a fairly obvious sort of pollution, but there are other types of pollution. There's the pollution of sin, and we feel that pollution around us. Like the smog of the great cities, it can be the very air that we breathe. And like people living in the cities, we become acclimatised to it. And we don't notice it as much. You know, I saw a little clip on the internet Um, last week of a a game show from sometime I think in the 1960s and it was one of those married couple game shows and uh, the the husband was recounting a story of how he had put a a plastic spider in the shower and his, his wife had run screaming from the shower and then she said and that was before we were married and then she she covered her face Uh, with her hands uh, in in mortification. She realised what she had said on television uh, and there was this laughter and and the the host sort of uh, shaking his head in in almost in disbelief that she would say such a thing on television. And in today's world, that wouldn't even be remarked on. Um, For we live in a climate that has ditched God's idea of marriage more, not, not completely, but massively, colossally. Um, And that's the climate in which we live, that such a thing as that would no longer be seen as odd. And yet there are all sorts of other ways that we find this pressure at work around us, the atmosphere of pollution, and the language people use, in the jokes they tell, and the things they're watching and sharing with us, expecting us to laugh and to watch the whole area of sexuality. It's the the atmosphere that we're breathing in. And add to that another more subtle level of pressure and pollution again, that there's that of of actions, but then there's that of values that underlie the actions, the things that people think are important, the way that people think, the integrity that people display and expect to be displayed. And all of this permeates the environment in which the Christian lives. And we are called to live in this world and to be different. And we are called by Peter to live as strangers to the world and in the world, not to be sucked in by it. In this letter, he has reminded them of the living hope that is theirs. He's called them to live as strangers. And now in this third section of the letter, he's speaking about suffering and how to endure it. There's overlap between the the living as strangers and the suffering because as we we live differently, that will bring about trouble as people react against uh, how Christians live. And Peter is wondering what does Christianity look like at that interface between us, the Christian, and the world around us, between us and family, between us and employers, between us and friends, between us and neighbours. And that's what he's dealing with here. And he has 
he has instructed these Christians and instructed us that as far as we can, in our obedience to God, we are to live such grace-filled, beautiful lives, lives of uh, kindness and lives of submission, that we are to pour the oil of, of grace into that interface between us and the world so there is as little friction as possible in it. But suffering and conflict can't be avoided. Well, it can be. Um, it can be in the sense of if we want to hide our values, but Peter has called us not to do that. And so uh, how are we to, to live in this world for our Saviour? And he points out two great fixed Beacons of light, like two great searchlights. One is in the past and shines forward onto our lives in the present. And that's Christ's death. We see it in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body. There he's pointing us back to what has been his, his focus. Christ's death on the cross for his people. That's one of the great spotlights that shines on our lives. And then the other one, the other great spotlight that shines down is Christ returned. And we see it in verse uh, 7. In verse 7, the end of all things is near. And these two, well, maybe more like lighthouses. These two lighthouses guide us how to live. We live, as it were, in the, the intersection of the two great beams of light. One coming from the past, Christ's death, and one coming from the future, Christ's impending return. And they fill us with gladness and with hope. And that is how we are to be equipped to live for Christ in this world of sinful pollution. We need both of them gladness and hope, the cross and the return. If we only had the cross of Christ, well, we would have no hope. Why bother living for him? If we only had the return of Christ and no cross, well, how would we look forward to his return? For we would still be in our sins. We need both. And not only would we only have the, the return ahead of us, but we would have nothing to motivate us to live for Christ's return. It's the cross that equips us and motivates us to look ahead to Christ's return. And so, two points this evening. The first one's the longer of the two. Fight pollution. Fight sinful pollution. Or fight sin. Because Christ is your saviour. See this in verses 1 to 6. Fight sinful pollution. Because Christ is your saviour. The Christian. No Christian is perfect. We're not home yet. We're flawed. And Peter is calling us. He's called us already. In chapter 1 verse 15. To be holy. To be holy. God says for I am holy. That means we. Although we live in a polluted world. And although we are not perfect. We are to seek to be as holy. As a human being can be. To wrestle with pollution, to fight against it. And he, he gives us three things here to grasp that will help us to fight. The first is this. Grasp that Christians have made a clean break with sin. Grasp that Christians have made a clean break with sin. He says in verse 1, Therefore, therefore, now, why does he say, therefore, he's, he's tying it back. He's tying it back to what he's told us earlier in chapter 3. He's told us in chapter 3 that it's, it is at times God's will for us to suffer in verse 17, for doing good. And he says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And since Christ suffered and endured, you who are one of Christ's followers, are called to do the same. And now remember how that section finished. Chapter 3 and verse 22. Cast your eye up to it. The same Jesus who suffered also 
triumphed and rose from the dead and is in heaven at God's right hand and everything's in submission to him. And we who are joined to Jesus follow that same trajectory through the suffering and then the glory. So don't expect to avoid trial and difficulty. But how, but how are we going to live for it then? Well, arm yourself, Peter says, with this mindset, this mindset that Christ had. Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. And this word arm yourself that's used here, it, it's used um, to describe uh, heavily armoured troops. Um, it's used, we might say, it's not the ordinary policeman, it's the riot police. It's to suit up for battle. If it was describing medieval knights, it would be put on your suit of armour. And this is about having a mindset. Have the same attitude. Arm yourself with the same attitude. And that attitude is this. That the Christian is someone who has been set free from sin. The Christian is someone who has been set free from sin. As Adam's descendants, we could not escape sin. We were bound to sin. But now that we are joined to Christ, the controlling power of sin has been broken. And we need to remember that because the battle starts in the mind. It's all about mindset. I remember reading a book by the famous 200 and 400 metre sprinter, Michael Johnson, um, an incredible runner who was rarely defeated uh, in his uh, entire career. And he, he spoke of how sometimes he'd be sitting in the room getting ready uh, to go out uh, to the track and the other athletes were there and he would see some of the other runners going past him and he would think, wow, there's Frankie Fredericks, the great 200 metre sprinter. Oh, he, he's looking in good form. And then he said, I would catch myself on. i say, I need to stop looking at him. And he would go in his mind to, to think of his own start, the reaction, uh, the, the, the stride pattern as he would come out of the blocks. And then as he would accelerate round the bend. And then as he would come down the straight and in the 200 metres coming down that final straight and dipping for the line. And he would think himself into his own race. And he said this, that too often... He'd be talking to other runners and, and they would say things like, well, you know, you don't need to worry, you're the favourite. And he thought to himself, well, what sort of a mindset is that? You're already defeated before you start. If you're thinking I'm the favourite, you don't go into a race thinking you're going to lose, he says. And you see, the battle is won in the mind and Peter gets that. He says, arm yourself also with the same attitude that I am going to suffer rather than sin. I will battle because my Saviour battled for me and he battled to set me free from the, the power of sin. I don't need to sin. And we need to win the battle in our heads. I was reading another book recently about uh, a man who swam right round Great Britain. 157 days swimming for 12 hours a day. No days off, kept swimming. How do you do that? It's up here. It's all in the mind. As you get in and you keep on going and going and going. And his book is about the art of resilience and how he kept himself going as he battled this colossal challenge. And you see, very much in the 21st century, we have sloppy thinking and we've bought into Myths of thinking that we can't help ourselves and that we are victims of our feelings. And Peter says, arm, arm yourself with this same attitude that Christ would suffer rather than sin. And Christ suffered for us so that we could be set free from sin. And then he says something intriguing. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. What an odd thing to say. Now, he's not saying that pain makes us holy, as if you could take a, 
a scalpel and, and stab yourself repeatedly in the hand and somehow that would, that would finish you with sin. It would make you more holy. That's not it. But he's talking here about, you see, every Christian faces crunch points. Will I sin or will I suffer? Will I put Christ first or will I put my ease first? And the more we put Christ first and take whatever flack comes, the more we cut the cords that bind us to sin, the more we reprogram the habits of disobedience and program the habits of obedience, the more Ross Edgley got up in the morning, checked the tide times, got on his wetsuit, got into the water, took the first strokes and just kept taking the next stroke, the more he conditioned himself to do that day after day as he swam around Great Britain. And so with the Christian, as we don't listen to our desire for ease. But we grasp that I have made a clean break with sin because of Jesus and that yes, it's going to be tight going. But I can fight through this testing and this temptation and I can come out the other side of it because Christ has promised I will come out the other side of it. As we do that, that will break the power of sin in our hearts and lives. And it's, it's an ongoing thing. And then that brings us to our second point. Grasp that Christians make their choices for God. We choose God. Grasp, not only there's been a clean break, but grasp that we make our choices for God. The Christian doesn't live for sin. But he does what God wishes. Look at what he says in verse 2. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the, the will, or could be translated, the wish, the wish of God. What does God wish for you? What does God desire for you? We don't live for our own desires anymore. We live for God's desires. He knows what's best. He's infinitely wise. And the Christian sees life as a choice, a series of choices. A choice between the old ways and the new ways. The old habits and the new habits. Sometimes it's even a choice between the old friends, the old acquaintances and new ones. Ones that, the old ones that pulled us into sin and new ones they pull us away from it. Are we going to live as God wills or as godless people choose to live? What way are we going to choose? And the good news is that Christians can choose. Christians can choose. And, and he, he gives us motivation here um, in verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. We've wasted enough time, he says. Let's choose not to waste time. Let's choose to invest in God's ways. Every day is a choice. And because we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we are able to make the right choices. We have his strength to do so. We don't want to waste our lives. I remember John Piper telling the story uh, about his father being a preacher and this man in the town who ridiculed and mocked the gospel. And then eventually one night he came to a meeting that Piper's father was preaching at and, and he was an old man now. And by this stage, uh, he was an old man. And as he listened to the sermon, he came under conviction of sin. And as he waited at the end of the service and spoke to Piper's father, he came to faith in Christ. But what made an indelible impression on the young John Piper was the man sobbing, I've wasted it, I've wasted it, he'd wasted his life. And you know, it's possible even for us as Christians to waste our salvation, not to waste it in an eternal sense, but to waste what God is going to do because we don't choose God's ways, because we go back to the old habits, the old ways. We, we don't make our choices for God. And Peter says that we are to choose 
what God desires. Motivated by what Christ has done at the cross. We have one God-given life. We choose to live it for him. For nobody else is going to go to the cross for us. And then the third thing to grasp in this first point is to grasp that Christians live for God's verdict. Peter knows that as we choose God's way and not the ways of the people around us, that it's going to bring ridicule. Look at what he says. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. Have you found that? People mocking you. Uh, people uh, thinking you weird or strange. People taking a second glance. People sneering. People perhaps bullying some of the young people at school because they, they won't do something. They won't say something. They won't look at something. We need to be prepared to be thought odd. Young people, you need to be prepared to be thought odd. Nobody likes that. But look at what Peter says. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Don't you worry about the opinion and the judgment of people around you. Worry, rather, about the judge of all the earth. And remember that those who ridicule, who heap abuse, who think that you are odd or strange, are going to have to give an account to him who at that very moment is ready to judge the living and the dead. What a sobering thought. The Christian grasps that they live their life for God's verdict, not the verdict of people. In verse 6, Peter says, For this reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. He's thinking about those who have already died, the, the first generation of Christians. And Christ hasn't returned. And the, Christi the, the non-Christians are saying, look, what was the point of following Jesus? Look at those ones there. They've, they've died. Jesus hasn't come for them. And the unbelievers have made their judgment according to the body, according to the people's bodies. They, they've died. But Peter says, no. They can't see the reality. These people who are now dead live spiritually, according to God. They, they live in God's sight. They are alive and will, will be made alive in the resurrection and receive their resurrection bodies. And on that day, it will not seem any loss that you have missed out on some things in this world. Or to put it another way, it will not seem any great pleasure on the day of judgment when God calls other people to give an account for what they did and what they enjoyed in this world if they've missed out on Christ. And so we are called to fight the pollution around us and within us by remembering that a clean break has been made with sin and we're to arm ourselves, to be ready to face trials and sufferings for Christ's sake so that we can fight sin, so that we can be holy as he is holy. And we're to remember that Christians were faced with a choice. We don't have to sin. We can choose God's ways. And yes, we're going to face pressure. But those who put pressure on us will have to face God's verdict. And we live in the light of a God who will judge the world. And so uh, we are to fight pollution in us and around us uh, because we have a saviour who has rescued us. And then secondly, and more briefly, not only are we to fight pollution, sinful pollution, but we are to live purely. We are to live purely because Christ is returning. That's the other great fixed lighthouse that guides the Christian. Here's the positive side to Christian living. We're told in verse 5 that God is ready to judge. We're told in verse 7 that the end of all things is near. We're to live in the light of that. 
Now, the end is nigh has long been a placard associated with the crazies. The people that, that walk around with the, the billboards or the placards saying, the end is nigh, the end is nigh. And people think, oh, well, yeah, you've been doing that for a long time. Well, you know, actually, in Peter's day, they were saying the same thing. They were mocking Christians for thinking that the end was coming. And in Second Peter chapter 3, Peter quotes some of them, where is this coming that you're speaking about? And so it's not new. It's the next item on God's agenda. We need to grasp that. God's agenda goes like this. He, he creates the world to display his glory and he makes the people to know him and the people rebel against him. But he sends a saviour to redeem them. And then he waits patiently as he draws people from all over this world and all over time to, to know and to love this saviour so they can enjoy God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But the next point on the agenda is the return of the Saviour to make everything new and to judge the living and the dead. That's next on the to-do list, as far as God's concerned. And only the patience of God delays it. And whenever people mock the delay, it would be a bit like um, a trapeze artist mocking the rope that holds his trapeze up that, that keeps him alive. And so Christians are to remember that Christ is coming back. And we are to live purely um, and graciously and winsomely, as Peter has called us to, in the light of Christ's return. And Peter says three things here. He says, therefore, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. We're to be clear-minded and self-controlled. We're not crazy to think that Christ is coming back. That's how the world will end. And so we are not to get sucked into panic mode by all sorts of other cataclysmic speculation, whether it will be a nuclear holocaust or whether um, there will be an economic meltdown or whether Bill Gates is trying to reprogram all of humanity by these vaccinations. The world will end when Jesus Christ returns. We are to be clear-minded and self-controlled. We are to be level-headed people who remember that this is the big picture. We are not to get sucked into the live-for-the-moment mentality of verses 3 and 4. But we are to remember the big moment, the moment that will define all other moments when Christ returns. And that means that we aren't sucked into fleeting pleasures, or flummoxed or anguished by passing crises. We are to think clearly, to be level-headed. And that alertness to the bigger picture then leads us to pray for the big picture needs of our world, for the spread of the gospel, for the salvation of our children for their handing on the baton of the gospel to the next generation, to pray for the lost around us. We are to think clearly. We are to love deeply. Look at verses 8 and 9. How are we to live in the light of Christ's return? Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. We are to love deeply. There's to be a, a sustained, strenuous effort as we come near the finishing line to love our brothers and sisters in Christ so that there's something about us that gives off the aroma of the one who loves us deeply. How could I hold something against uh, my brother or sister in Christ that Christ went to the cross for and bore their sins in his body on the tree? He loved them that much. And I wonder here, whenever Peter says, love covers over a multitude of sins, is he remembering the time he asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Would, would seven be enough? And now as an old man, Peter gets that no. When you're following Jesus and you're being made into the image of Jesus, love covers over 
a multitude of sins. He's not saying that we sweep things under the carpet. He's talking about things done to us. Do we allow bitterness to creep in? Do we revisit those things that people have done to us with a festering resentment, allowing it to flourish? Or do we think ourselves into their shoes? Do we see things in the best light? Or even if we know that they deliberately meant to harm us, we say to ourselves, well, God will deal with it. And I can leave that aside. Love can cover over a multitude of sins. Instead of pollution coming into us with bitterness and resentment, we allow love to flourish in us as we relate. Because, never mind friction with the world, there'll be friction amongst believers. And yet, we are to be a community of God's people living for him in this world in a way that is different. A way that shows that we have been radically changed. And we are to serve to glorify God. We are to think clearly, love deeply, and to serve to glorify God. Verses 10 and 11. The King is coming. The King is coming. We are to be ready. We are to use all of our gifts, all of our abilities. Do you see how Peter describes them here? Whether it's hospitality, whether it's uh, whatever gifts... We have them, I think, what gifts do I have? But look at how he describes it. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Kindness. God's kindness. How does the person beside you need kindness displayed to them or spoken to them? How do, does that Christian in your church need God's grace displayed to them? You mightn't think that that's a gift that you've got, picking up the phone and talking to somebody. It mightn't seem like a gift, but it's faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms, in its multitude of forms. We are to seek to be servants because the King is coming and we're to be ready. Whenever the Queen visited, the Queen of England visited Chicago in 1959, the hotels were put on notice that the, the Queen was coming and that they were to make themselves ready for whichever one she might choose to stay at. Uh, and one hotel, the Drake Hotel, um, said, no, we'll not be making any plans to be ready for the Queen to stay with us. They were surprised at this attitude. And they said, we're always ready for the Queen to come and stay with us. That should be the attitude of the Christian. We're always ready. We're always serving, knowing that the king could come. And that, that serving, as Peter goes on to say, it could be speaking, it could be serving with the strength that God provides in all sorts of ways. We're to do it. Anything that needs done, whether it's being a friendly voice, whether it's serving by going and doing the shopping for people, whether it's putting little, as some of you know, putting little uh, packages together and taking them to people, um, bringing God's grace into the lives of those around us, whether it's being a listening ear, whatever it is. It's not done for self-glory, but it's done because we know Christ has done so much for us and, and we can pass it on to others. And you see, how do we live in a world where there's pollution that would come into us. We pour out Christ-likeness to those around us, loving deeply, thinking clearly, serving richly. That's how we're to live, not being transformed by the world and its impact on us, but seeking to spread a fragrance, an aroma of Christ, making a difference to those who are around us, letting them see something of Christ. This is how we are called to live. So let's seek to put Christ first, remembering what he has done for us so that we will face the trials well and remembering what he's done for us and remembering that he is coming back so that we will live with a gladness and a servant-heartedness and a joyfulness expecting the king to return. That way we will live purely in a world of pollution. And we will be that blast of fresh air and cold, pure water that 
people around us so desperately need. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we read these ancient words of Peter, he understands our psychology so well and our hearts so perfectly. He knows our fears of what people might think. And yet we thank you that he reminds us of the destructiveness of the ways that they seek often to entice us into. They don't want us to behave in a right way because it's just like another voice of conscience chipping away at what they're doing. And they don't want that. And he knows too how we need to strengthen our own hearts and minds for obedience. And we thank you that he reminds us of that, to arm ourselves with this same attitude that Christ had, knowing that even though there was suffering ahead, that triumph lay on the other side of it. And so help us to do the same. Father, we pray uh, for each of us that you would help us to, to fight the pollution that is within and around and to grow in Christ-likeness so that we spread, as Paul would put it, the, the fragrant aroma of Christ. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.